Okay, so how about ones that um, humbling with store management like this, okay? Uh, so after I left Robinson's, I went up and ran Nordstrom. I replaced uh, Jody Hofberg was running San Francisco. And I caught it at a really good time because that's when they were expanding like crazy. So I opened the San Francisco. I opened like four or five uh, Nordstrom stores in Northern California, which was cool. But anyways, Nordstrom, as you, as you know, is a different breed. The way they operate, the way they treat the customers, and in particular, the way they treated lease depart people like us as lease departments. And we were, if not the only one, one of only two departments that were. And um, from the moment I got there, I did not get along with the VP of stores, a guy by the name of Ray Johnson, who, as I recall, was, the, was married to one of the Nordstrom sisters, so he was a brother-in-law. And he was in charge of, um, of Northern California. And... You know, again, Nordstrom, very liberal policy with customer service. And, you know, it's hard taking a three or four or five or seven thousand dollar return credit is painful, you know. And again, back then when I was young and not as uh, congenial as I might be today, um, you know, I had this customer who wanted to return this code. And I said no. And I said no. And I said no. And, I, you know, all her attempts. And then they do the thing that all those customers do, which is work way up the chain. And eventually she gets to Ray Johnson, who obviously immediately sells her. He'll give her the credit. So he calls me up and he tells me to give her the credit. And in my inimitable fashion, again, back then in my 20s, I told him no. A little more sternly than that. There was this pause on the phone. And I could almost hear him leaning into the phone, and he goes, you take that credit, and you knock that chip off your shoulder, or I'll come down there and knock it off for us. Do you want that back to your Nordstrom card or Murphy? So that was my lesson with him that too. So, you know, again, when you're under 30, you got to learn the hard way sometimes. All right. I, I got one. Mike Lerman. Okay. You remember Mike? He was the regional merchandise manager. And as the mink buyer at the time, used to have to take tours with to the different stores so that we could, you know, have a better eye together on merchandise operation. As he had the dread problem. Because you remember, he was like 400 pounds. We all had similar company cars he needed a hummer but he was driving like a car right i remember his nick what was his nickname mike lerman's nickname the world's largest furrier that's it <laughs> okay so our first stop was maryville indiana and actually our first stop was bob evans and I remember sitting across from Mike, and he orders this big bowl of, it was biscuits and gravy, you know, like a southern, oh, it looked like vomit. And, and he's like, aren't you going to eat anything? I said, I'm just going to have coffee. Have my coffee. He eats that and probably a stick of toast, a loaf. And now we head to Merrill, you know, to the, to the store into the store it was it was just a i don't know a, a, low, a greeting call you know it, it was it was literally just you know a meet and greet kind of thing i didn't have time to go through the inventory he goes come on we gotta get out of here okay so now we drive two hours to get to maryville eat at bob Ed. now we gotta leave and we head to north rivers okay at North Riverside, I thought we'd go into the mall and stop at a place called Bishop's Chill. He said, this is the best Philly in the world. This is why we called her the world's largest furrito. Yes. Yes. Anyway, we must have been there for 45 minutes to him. And he was correct. It was delicious chili. After that, now we go to North Riverside. Artie was the um, original. I mean, the, the store manager, Marty Cole. And we go in there. Now, I, I, I knew Marty for years. I don't think I had five minutes with merchandise. 
says, come on, we got to go. We got to go to Yorktown. Okay. Or now this was the day. On the way between North Riverside and Yorktown, there was a chicken place. I think it was called Pioneer Chicken. Like a fast food. It was either Browns or Pioneer. They're both, uh, they're both, I think they're both all over Chicago, yeah. We, we literally left Bishop's Chili on the way now to Yorktown. He says, I got to stop and get something to eat. And we go through the drive through and he gets, it was like a little box chicken. For him, it was a snack. I think it was a family meal for food. He was driving with this thing on his lap. His belly was already hitting the steering. And now with, and he's got greasy fingers and like, sir, the right turn. I said, I am going to die on this trip. I, I knew it. Anyway, we finally do get to Yorktown. Spent about time. I guess he was full. We must have spent 45 minutes in, in York. But, but we're, we're talking 80, 20 amount of time spent in fast food places versus stores. I'm t that's what I'm saying. It, at least in Yorktown, he must have been full because I was able to actually go through the inventory. And I didn't want him touching it because his hands were greasy still. So was, that was um, sort of humbling because this was my boss. It, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just, I always just wanted to be that guy that, you know, go a little, a little bit extra, which will lead me into another story. So when I first joined Evan, they would not put me in the training program because I did not have a college. I had, I had been to two colleges. I never, I never graduated, never you know, about my degree and moved to Chicago and my dad Basically, got the door open for me to me a job there. First assignment was working in our telephone sales department. Do you remember Betty Kutak? He's the nicest woman in the world. But now, if I am a, an 18-year-old, you know, man or, or boy man, and boy, go ahead. And, you know, I wanted to stand, I was, I was in a room with, I'll say probably 20 uneducated people. Their job, strictly our job, I was one of them at the time, was to contact customers that had their furs, you know, that had purchased furs or had their furs in storage to con contact them for additional service, you know, to either restyle or cleanings. Well, I was earning $3 in it. it gave, now, it was 19, it, what was it, 1977. So it wasn't terrible. But, you know, for an 18-year-old kid, well, I wanted more. And I don't know, I just felt like do more. These people were going to work in shorts, summertime. They were going to work in shorts, t-shirt. I went to work, even though I was sitting in her office. Sport jacket, a tie, and a, you know, a dress shirt, and slack. And I felt like I was much more professional. Anyway, I was contacting people, and, like, they had what they called the soft dough. Help preservation prop was, I mean, I think in English it translated to bullshit. It was all nothing bad on services. Made you, they made it sound as if they were taking out the lining of your coat. Well, lanolide, they're using lanolide and, and lanolizing the, the, uh, the pelts so that they supple and your coat's going to last forever. So it was $5 and 45 cents, you know, additionally over the charge of a, a clean, you know, so they gave you a, a, a VIG, you got a commission 
by selling this, she got, I think it was either 50 cents or the 45 cents uh, from the 545. And I felt, you know what? I need to earn more money. I'm going to really excel it. And I tell you, Scott, when I found my niche as a salesman, because everybody I spoke to, oh, yeah, you, you, you that's going to preserve my coat? Yeah, and it's only $5.45. I'll do it. I have four coats. Do it on those four. Um, okay, there's two bucks. Now, um, every single customer that I spoke with, I offered them that soft opelt preservation process. And I got to, we had like cue cards on how to, you know, how to sell it. I threw those away. I, I was like, I got, it. I am literally, I would say 80% of the people I spoke to, the soft opelt. I spoke to like four or five people, you know, within the hour. I was making now, you know, not not three dollars an hour. I'm making five dollars, and I'm patting myself. I'm looking up my new suits and stuff. Anyway, after about a month, get um, call from Ted Geller, who is the head of the sermon. And he calls me into his office. You know, you need to, we need to have a meeting. I want you to come to the office. And I'm thinking to myself, look at me. I'm going to get promoted. I'm doing, I knew that I'm watching everybody else. Nobody else tolerating it, selling, you know, cleaning, let alone soft opel preservation. I'm, I'm all, I'm sitting there all like, he to accept my award. And he says to me, Larry, we have a problem. This to me, he, he says to me, you're selling the soft old pulp preservation product. I says, yeah, I said, I'm, I'm selling it. You know, I, I'm, I'm doing pretty well with it. He says, problem is you're selling it on cloth coats too. And he says, we can get trouble. And I thought to myself, God, here I am. I thought I'm going to be promoted, you know, because I'm doing such a great job. And I got knocked down two notches because throwing it on cloth. I was just a little pissed off because I went back to three bucks. Who doesn't love a rags to riches story? But a rags to riches to collapse story? There were two Evans Furs. The one that climbed to the top of the highest peak, amazing story and the one that tumbled from that peak decades later. But that's not the tragedy. The tragedy is what happened in between. They lived the American dream, and they let a lot of people come in and live it with them. And it was a wonderful story until it wasn't. Coming from a, a generation that was so driven and willing to work 18 hours a day to be successful, there aren't that many people like that anymore. They, they created something out of whole cloth, and he helped kings and queens around the world with their fur coats. That was the era, uh, I would say, the golden era of department stores and specialty stores. Genetics loads the gun, but it's the environment that pulls the trigger. Non-existent parenting, and so they didn't learn how to cope with stresses. And I just look at the damage that my father created and the things that he has said. But it certainly caused a, a significant rift in the family and families and, and you know, a number of us didn't communicate with each other for a long time. You marry into the family, you marry into the business because that is your life. Clearly, 
there were problems. Uh, he ruled with an iron fist that Ted Keller. He had a way. In fact, I remember one time, and you know, and he he wanted to teach me young to put me in my place as far as my family ties and everything. And he was right because I was a little too cocky. Um, like I remember one time I was sick, he called around till he found me because I wasn't really sick, you know. So, <laughs> and he found me. So, okay, here, let me think of what I can do here. Um, let's leave that for the end. Um, okay, here's another embarrassing one. Um, uh, you ever, you ever have to deal with, uh, David and when you were in LA? LA? No. Okay. So, I mean, I mean, I don't think David actually ever toured the, the LA one in the two years that I was there. Okay. Well, in the, in the almost two and a half, in the three years before I went to San Francisco, he came a couple, a couple of times. And because he's my cousin, I had to be the one to slap him around and everything. Entertain him. Which was fine. Unless you're fucked up. And one thing that was, you know, one thing that was really hard for me back in those days, especially in a place like L.A., remember, we were driving from stores to from San Diego to Santa Barbara to Palm Desert to that, that whole triangle. There was no GPS. You had to work, you had to lord your way around. And I was not one good with maps. Um, and, you know, it's like it, it took me repetition to learn shit like that. So um, David would come out and, you know, David had David did not have a lot of patience for uh, mistakes and whatnot. And David used to come in on his private plane and he'd fly it and land it in Burbank. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to the Burbank airport, but as I recall, you have to cross the set of tracks to get there. That's not the easiest set of tracks to get around. Yeah. And one time taking him, and remember, it's his private plane. For, yeah. So he's not on a schedule or anything. But one time taking him back to Burbank, I literally could not get across the tracks to get to the other side. As he's huffing and puffing, and the exasperation increases. And I finally, then Larry's in the back seat, like ready to kill me. And, and finally, um, uh, I did get him there. But for months, he would say to me, have you figured out how to get to Burbank yet? Uh, and you just find the hard way sometimes. He, he, you know what? He used to make me nervous. That's what it was. He made me well because of the way he was. He would. It was either the charming thing or he made you very nervous around. Yes, yes, yes. Because you wanted to please. Simple as that. You know, by pleasing him, being in his good graces, it was a good place. To Julius and Rose Meltzer went forward with the belief that their son's death was an accident. And this setback rocked the family during a time when brother A.L. and Herman's Evans Furs was skyrocketing to the top of the industry. Those Meltzer kids obviously weren't taught how to cope or how to parent or, or you know, the relationship skills were really lacking and that got passed down. All I know is that he had a photograph of him where he was brilliant and the family loved him. Yeah, I think she loved the way I looked, so she was always, you know, like I was her little doll. All of his grandchildren wrote reports on Nuremberg at some point in school. You know, someone would always have an assignment, interview some relative about something. Nonchalantly would toss a question out and the Beads of sweat were pouring off as he's trying to answer Uncle Bernie's question. A lot of people live in fear that, you know, oh my God, is that going to happen to me? In 
you know, toy dinosaur on the table and he says, you know what he happened to these dinosaurs. It was a, a, a very unique era. Jeff and I got some calls and people were just sobbing. Well, they shut the doors on people. That was pretty high profile. A fish has got to swim and an eagle's got to soar. That's their natural temperament and how they want to live and how they want to play. And when that's blocked, people are really unhappy. Okay, so speaking on that same story, I'm going to, uh, so while I'm telling this story, you think about if you have any such uh, regretful moments, okay? Um, and that, and this has to do with the, the person that we're talking about here that you and I both worked for, Larry Friedman. So Larry Friedman, when I met him, I, I was um, in, in just out of that training program and um, working with all the b divisionals and Bob buyers on the 13th floor there. And Larry was one of them then. And I don't remember if that was, when, was he, he was the first one to go to Robinson's? Yes. Okay. So that was when we acquired Robinson's. And Larry being from California was more than, wait a second, wait a sec. He was not the first. First. In blow. Oh. Damn, but he was short lived. Yep. But damn blum. Was the first when that time came and they sent Larry, he was more than happy to go back out because he was from San Francisco and was just happy to be in California. Um, subsequently, you went out as his assistant, and then when they rotated you out, I took your place as his assistant with uh, Sylvia and her bangles. And <laughs> remember Sylvia? Yep. And um, and Larry was great, great trainer, great mentor. I love Larry to death. Me. Too. Uh, so then they rotated me out of there, and I went to San Francisco for two and a half years. And as I said earlier, um, that was a great time to be at Nordstrom in the Bay Area because they were opening stores every six months, and so I opened four or five stores there. Um, and then they called me one day, and they said, this is my most regretful moment in this company. Um, they called me one day, and they said, we're getting rid of Larry Friedman, and we want you to go back and take over LA because that was our largest uh, lease department. So again, as a young whippersnapper, I'm like, woohoo, because this is a great opportunity. I didn't stop and think about, you know, the false clout, you know, and, and also, you know, if it wasn't me, it was going to be somebody else. They were making the move, right? Oh, absolutely. So, so, and, and this also, uh, coincides with the story I think you and I talked about the last time we spoke where I talked about Craig O'Malley and I discussing Bob McGrath and him coming out of the, the bathrooms, the toilet stall in the bathroom. So this is all that same thing. But anyways, so they go, okay, you're going to go back to LA and you're going to take over running those 15 stores, which is, you know, our largest uh, lease department in the business. And um, they had me go. And again, I regret doing this to this day. So they had me, and I wish I could have taken it back, but there's no way, and it ruined my relationship with him, obviously. we I, I kind of tried, but it never recovered. When we went to Robinson, they had me go wait in the dress department, um, and they did that, and you know, and then you, you marched in like a good soldier, and here, you know, the, the old boss, the new boss is the same as the old boss, here's the new boss. <laughs> and, um, you know, and that was, a, like I said, you know, when I think about, uh, my regretful moments at Evans, that's my biggest regretful moment. Cause again, that was the guy that mentored me. I probably learned more from him than anybody else. When I was in that company in those two and a half years there, he had a real subtle hands off system of running us through his meat grinder and having to really learn at the end of it. And so like to this day, when I think about it, I still feel bad. No, I can understand that. Larry was a great guy, but again, you know what? That is part of the um call it training that evans or exposure and training that evans gave us to basically look as as the boss you got to be capable and able to do that yep you know what i mean it's a tough thing imagine me i had something similar but it was with jeffrey Meltzer. Mm. 
remember, I replaced him in Hong Kong. And although, honestly, I wasn't regretful at the time because I was more concerned about the company and feelings. And I was the guy that was traveling, you know, all the time to Hong Kong. And when Stuart Amy left, and then, was it? Tommy. Tommy. We have a kid. Tommy and I were living together. We were sharing a two-bedroom condo in Chicago on the 16th floor of this gorgeous tower that we couldn't have afforded if, you know, if we rented separate one bedroom. So, yes, yeah, so somebody, I think it was Robert, said to me, it's Scott, Tommy, Tommy, Scott, because they were bringing him from New York, and we rented this apartment together, and we lived together for two, two and a half years till I got engaged. Yeah. Well, so, like, yeah, we, I guess it was, it was Tommy, and that Tommy left to start his own business. First, Stuart left to start his own business. Tommy left to start his own business. And then I guess David decided, you better put somebody there that's going to stay, or that, that has longevity with not only the company, but the family. Well, and I can remember being in a factory in Korea at Fam Jump. And showing a lot. And this this man was the head of the Korean fur industry and had a long, long, long relationship. And the melting. And when we would travel there, he would he would like banquets. You know, there was he'd have parades for us because we were supporting the Korean fur industry. No, she, Sharon told me that you would like we would pull up into a in a bus or you know, like a mini bus or whatnot to these places and they'd have twenty five or thirty people out there clapping and clapping. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You have like a parade, uh, the, the division corporate divisional merchandise my like card. Stuff. It was like you know a major title, and and I basically every time we made a major buy, I was there. You know whether. Greece or Hong Kong or New York, whatever. And it got to be, I had a young family and it was pretty tough on me or tough on my family. Right. Because I was traveling all the time. Here I am in New York. Well, I had been in Hong Kong. It was when, it was when we were doing, we had a contract with the make to do uh, the mink teddy bears. It was a giftless promotion. The first time I ever heard EWP, a, a gift was purchased for Mother's Day for the jewelry department. Spend a hundred dollars and get you know a hundred dollar value. It's spent literally a month traveling between Greece and Hong Kong and China, trying to get these things produced. Okay, okay, so. Here I am. Uh, I was in streets in Hong Kong for about a month. I come home to sh Chicago where I was living. And we had to make a trip to New York. It was like a two-week trip to New York. I remember coming home from Hong Kong. I literally, I think I was home for two days. I was there to change bags and now go to New York. I was in New York. It was the second night I was in New York. It's about 1 o'clock in the and I get a telephone call. Dave, at one in the morning. With, yeah, this was, there was no Patty K on this call. It was just Dave. And he said to me, Larry, we need you to go to Hong Kong. The, I was just in Hong Kong. Well, we have a problem. Factories are not making bears that uh, a company will. Vid, I'm supposed to be in New York for the next we need you to do this because Frank Nemirovsky, who was the guy who put together the deal, he owned the pattern for the rare bear. He's the one that he's going to sue us if we can't deliver on the make company order. So it was one o'clock in the morning, so maybe one thirty by the time I got off the phone with him. He says, "We already made you a reservation. You're leaving with Maria tomorrow morning." You're going to go to Chicago, and then you're leaving for uh, for Hong Kong the following. I mean, I, I did what I, you know, whatever they asked me. 
as we all did. I never had the opportunity to call my wife. Sickly, called her when I land. And I'm at O'Hare, a plane home. She goes, oh, we're going to go on vacation now? This is not a... I said, I have to go back to Hong Kong. And she goes, why? Yeah, I got to go back. She was pissed. And back at home. Huh? And I bet David didn't, David didn't waste time. I'm telling you, he called me at one o'clock in the morning to leave the following, you know, like in a few hours. And I wasn't leaving until the next day. Well, well one of them is, uh, involves you and I. Again, so uh, our paths have crossed here many times. So this one's a little embarrassing. <laughs> when we were younger, everybody, and not that much had changed, uh, we were big and bivers. But Larry had this gas mask with a hose. That was a, that you would attach to a pipe or a bong or whatever, and you would get extremely high from it. However, one day, Larry comes with this little black box about yay big. I wish I had something off my desk I could pull and show, but you know, like about the size of a cell phone, but but thicker. And it was the motor from a fish tank engine. <laughs> when you hooked it up to the pipe and the hose and the gas mask was an electric bong. It just kept forcing the hits into your mouth. Oh, it was called the executive toke. You just you just sat back and all you had to do was breathe. Anybody could do that. Right, you, to be an expert smoker. And like, well, we were. Well, we were, yeah. So anyways... That's one of my fonder memories. And one of my other fond mem weed memories, which you and I talked about last time on the podcast, was um, our friend Donald Springer. You know, when you would go to New York to visit, to do buying, and you would walk into his dad's place, Donald got the best, and I mean the best, Hawaiian Maui Waui weed. I, I, he was probably getting it in Hawaii, for all we know. And he would lay it out in the bathroom. And you'd go in with a little metal pipe and do a couple of hits and then come back out and buy. That wasn't the old, old he should rest in peace. So, you know, again, this time we're speaking well in, in retail and fashion was a really special time. And when we were young and in it, it was quite a hell of a party. You have one really good David story. All right, go quick because I think we only got three minutes left. David was in Hong Kong, and the last night that he was there, David, Henry's son, who was pro he was definitely the most respected manufacturer in Hong Kong, who also, he was the head of the Hong Kong Fur Fetter. And, you know, he was part of the meetings. And they invited me out to dinner, the three of them. And it was sort of, it was sort of interesting because he took us we were almost in China. It was in Shatin. And it was like, you know, you had to drive an hour and a half to get there. Finally, and Henry is saying, oh, the best restaurant in all of it, you know, was a vegetarian at the time. Like, you look around and that's all they serve. But they also, you know, I mean, they had like side dishes, rice and vegetables and stuff. Well, we were there for about three hours, and David wasn't eating, I wasn't eating, but we were all drinking pretty heavily, and that was the first time I had ever seen David, not only quick, but he was, he wasn't eating, and, you know, we were all, we were all pretty well hammered, and leave there at about, well, I'll tell you how hammered. Henry drove, lost his keys. He had to call his wife at like 1.30 in the morning. Oh, at 12, maybe it was 12 o'clock. Come and bring a set of keys for his for safety. That's not it. Anyway, anyway, we, we dropped David off at the hotel. Henry still drove. He dropped David off at the Shangri-La Hotel. And it had to be, by this point, 2, 2.30 in the morning. And we say our goodbyes. Henry dropped me off. 
I go home and it was about six or six thirty in the morning. I get a telephone. It's David. And anytime Patty Kay wasn't the one who made the contact, you knew something's wrong. You know, if he's making the call. He calls and he says, Larry, I need your help. What's the problem? He says to me, I overslept. He says, make the flight. I think he was meeting Sharon, one of his wives, in Hawaii. Oh, he goes, I, I, I'm going to miss my flight. I don't have time to pack my bag. I'm just going to leave and go to the hotel. Can you please go to the hotel and my bag's packed. And then she looked up. His room was a mess. I mean, a mess. It looked like he probably had tried to, you know, pack the stuff up. 